Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Zeev Haskell from the University of Virginia, and I'm very excited to bring you another one of the Department of Radiology and Medical Imaging keynote lecture series. We have an extraordinary panel of experts tonight on a topic that really matters to many of you, and not just in radiology. You're an anesthesiologist, you're a urologist, you're a pathologist, you are many more specialties. We don't see this coming, you need to see it coming. The topic tonight, practice models in modern radiology, traditional private equity consortia, venture capital and others. This is a primer because there is so much conversation that can be had on this. And we'll have some of that discussion, but it's, but we've assembled an extraordinary group of experts to give you that. And I'm gonna do some brief introductions now so we can get that going. Emphasis on brevity, our first presentation will be from uh, Dr. Howard Fleshen, who is the current president of the American College of Radiology, speaking on his own behalf, not on the ACR, as our other speakers with ACR collections here. Um, Dr. Fleischan has an extraordinary lengthy career in leadership and in matters of business and economics and service to radiology organized and all. Um, uh, his CV would fill three pages. So I'll tell you about uh, Dr. Frank Lexa, who is a neuroradiologist at the University of Pittsburgh, where he's uh, both professor and vice chair for faculty affairs. He has equal leadership responsibilities, American College of Radiology. He has published on leadership lessons and success in healthcare. He has won numerous awards in academic and service to radiology as well. Um, and has an extraordinary business background to bring to this. And finally, my longtime friend and colleague, interventional radiologist, Dr. Arl Van Moore, who just recently retired remarkably from an active practice with Charlotte Radiology in North Carolina. He is the Emeritus Board and Chairman and CEO of Strategic Radiology, so an extraordinary broad view of organized radiology, both from experience and from um, an active participant and an astute observer as well, president and board chairman for a very long time there as well. So with that and equal ACR responsibilities, I'm excited to start with Dr. Fleischan, who actually was kind of to record his talk, he got pulled away. So I'm going to play that quick talk and then we will move in with our next speakers. And here we go. Thank you for the opportunity to present tonight. I want to apologize for the video format. Totally my error. Also, I want to share that I feel honored to be in the same venue as Van Moore and Frank Lexa, two of the most informed on this topic, mentors. Review of evolving practice models, radiology and our marketplace are extremely dynamic. This will not be job search advice. We'll talk about some drivers, but analysis of healthcare economics will not be covered in sufficient detail. Our presentations by necessity are brief tonight. We all have multiple talks on the subject. We're happy to discuss with you individually. Our contact information will be available to you. I have no financial disclosures that are relevant to this presentation. I do have the honor of serving as your president of the American College of Radiology. I won't be presenting viewpoints from the APCR perspective tonight. Anything said will be my own. First, some data points. I'd like to present some information from, uh, in this case, Grandview Research, projecting the um, activity in the US imaging services market this, in this case, out till 2028, the estimate for the compounded annual growth rate is 7.3%. This is almost a consensus among analysts. I could show you 10 other research companies that show uh, very similar information. Looking at our ACR Career Center, these are trends in the job post postings. You can see in 2022, we had over 14,000 postings, again, represented a very robust job market. 2023 looks like it will 
be on the same pace, if not, if not even uh, greater numbers. So let's talk about demographic trends. First, from the consumer or our patients. There's an increase in demand for services as baby boomers uh, graduate into the Medicare demographic. Uh, Medicare beneficiaries tend to have increased utilization of services. Also, information and access. Patients are demanding access to studies immediately and also the reports. Reports sent directly to them rather than through their referring physician. For us, for radiology, um, we have started to focus on more of a work-life balance, also retirement. We are in the midst of our own version of a great resignation. Ownership versus employee. The information that I'm presenting here was gathered by Frost and Sullivan in 2018. Their synopsis was that the uh, early career radiologists don't put as much emphasis on ownership position versus employee uh, position when they're uh, looking at the job market. And we'll talk about that a little bit in subsequent slides. We're also experiencing a workforce shortage. Certainly the uh, amount of studies that are being produced in radiology uh, is um, far outpaces the, the workforce and the number of people uh, in our training programs, not only radiologists, but also technologists as well. The technologist shortage is uh, becoming rate limiting for many practices. I do wanna talk about definitions. It is important to be clear about uh, what specific practice we're talking about when, especially when we discuss private practice. Today's radiology is very dynamic specialty. We've witnessed lots of changes to practice models. The original comparisons were mostly between private practice and academics. In today's marketplace, private practice needs to be redefined. You'll be introduced to private equity and venture capital models by Drs. Moore and Lexa, but some practices under non-physician ownership now refer to themselves as quote unquote private. The term independent is becoming accepted as referring to a practice where most, if not all of the equity in the organization is owned by the physicians of the organization. There may be a small percentage owned by management as incentives. In most cases, it's the physician owners who also take on the operational and leadership responsibilities for the independent practice. For the purposes of my presentation, I'll be specific and talk about independent practice. Some strategic pathways for radiologists in today's marketplace. In the employee con uh, category, there's private equity. Now, uh, that needs to be qualified because some private equity positions do offer quote unquote partnership. Also, there are pu public companies that uh, are advertising for radiologists along with hospital positions. Hospital positions, uh, most commonly academics, is seen as the most secure environment. Staying independent, the merger and acquisition market in radiology is still fairly active. Some independent practices are also forming alliances, which we'll talk about later in this presentation. I do want to emphasize, despite lots of conversation, there are a number of sophisticated practices who have taken a look at the marketplace, they've done their due diligence, and they still feel very comfortable with their strategy, with their marketplace and their trajectory. And they have elected to stay the course. Independent practice is still a majority position in the US marketplace. This is slide needs some explanation. First is coming from the ACR workforce survey, which relies on self-reported information. The data has not been audited. Next, these numbers represent practices, not radiologists. So for instance, a practice with 10 people would have the same weighting as one with 100 radiologists. So if you take a look at the uh, category of national radiology practices, which includes uh, corporations, if you take a look at the number of radiologists here, as opposed to the number of practices, this number is probably significantly higher, more in the order of 10%. On this slide, again, from the workforce survey, private practice was the largest recruiter for jobs in 2021. 
In this analysis, please note that corporate or national practices are combined with multi-specialty organizations such as Mayo, Mayo, Leahy, and others. So the next few slides were the result of a survey that was published in a JECR in 2018. The query was to early career radiologists about what they think of private practice and job opportunities. So the first question was looking at potential private practice job opportunities, what best describes your actions? 83% of those interviewed had a preference for independent practice. Now, as we all know, uh, surveys uh, tend to have um, mixed results. I would offer to you that 83% is an overwhelming number, an overwhelming preference, uh, preference for independent practice. What do early career radiologists think about uh, business and leadership opportunities? And this goes back to uh, engagement, the employee versus uh, ownership positions that we talked about a few slides back. 79% want to be engaged in the businesses of the practice. Are early career radiologists concerned about their future practice being sold to private equity? Again, 72% an overwhelming number were concerned. This is also information from the, um, the workforce survey, the ACR workforce survey. Surprisingly, a significant number of early career radiologists saw academics as their preferred practice pattern. This came as quite a surprise to me. I'd be interested to hear what others think as, and also heard from their colleagues. For this slide, I must, career, I must admit I had some hesitation in creating and presenting. Uh, these are my own thoughts. There's no hard data here. Uh, these are independent practice considerations. So the first category I chose was practice building. So independent practice is a great venue for somebody to come in, build relationships with referring physicians and patients. On the other hand, on the con side, it's almost an expectation. When you come into private practice, you're not just bringing your expertise, you're not just showing up to, to work, but you're expected to participate in the future success of the practice. Independent practice tends to have a nimble business model, somewhat more flexible than large organizations. On the con side, they tend to have a less market influence than, let's say, a, a multi-hospital uh, system in the same uh, marketplace. A streamlined decision-making process, for instance, the decision to buy a, an MRI scanner uh, tends to be uh, more efficient in the independent practice model, but the purchasing power is certainly not as uh, significant as a large hospital system that is buying five or six MRIs, for instance. There tends to be a flat governance structure in independent uh, practice, again, uh, offering uh, flexible decision-making uh, for their business model, also practice building, but also that structure tends to uh, have uh, more of a focus on uh, politics. The engagement. Engagement in a practice means more opportunity for leadership and also practice building, as we've referred to previously. On the other hand, a practice is only as successful as the commitment of the partners and also the staff of the organization. Tends to be higher compensation and also higher productivity expectations or work hard, play hard philosophy. There also tends to be more vacation, but also more requirements for after hour coverage on weekends and weekdays because there are no fellows or residents to help. As I mentioned before, there are independent practices that are forming alliances. These alliances uh, leverage uh, opportunities uh, for operational efficiency, efficiencies and also geographic uh, diversification. Perhaps a quintessential model is strategic radiology. Certainly the largest made up of 33 practices, more than 1,500 radiologists serving more than 275 hospitals and more than 450 outpatient imaging sites. Another example is unified radiology. Over 700 radiologists participating, 13 member practices and operating in 20 states. 
So I wanted to go back to uh, this slide briefly and underscore another important point. Right now, there's high demand for radiologists. Every practice that I know of is looking to hire. Today, we're discussing different practice models. With this supply demand dynamics, it will be radiologists. It will be you who decide which practice models will be successful. You'll vote by which practice you sign up with to share your knowledge, your services, and your energy. You are, in fact, in control. This is self determination in many ways. So, again, I want to thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you tonight. Uh, looking forward to hearing uh, the presentations from uh, Frank Alexa and Van Moore via recording. Please don't hesitate to reach out and hear some of my contact mm -hmm. information. And again, thank you for your attention. Thank you for the opportunity to present tonight. So that was a fabulous introduction by Dr. Fleischman with, within the time that we have, and we'll pick that up in discussion as well. Um, there is a chat box so you can load your questions into that for the discussion afterwards. And with that, um, Professor Alexa, if you would. Okay, well, thank you very much, Professor Haskell. Thank you for uh, putting this together. And I also wanna thank Dr. Matsumoto for the kind invitation to do this. Um, I'm very honored to be speaking with both uh, Dr. Fleishan and Dr. Moore. Both of them have been mentors to me in the ACR. And what I'm going to do in focusing on this third of the presentation is talk to you a bit about venture capital and other investment models where you have a third party investment and some of the moral hazards that can occur in third party investment in healthcare by non physicians and non healthcare people. Um, as Dr. Haskell said, I've been a business school professor at Wharton for almost 20 years and have taught at some other business schools. So if I start saying some things that may rub you the wrong way, um, because I'm talking like a business person or like an investor, I'm doing that on purpose and I'm succeeding because I want you to understand how people outside of our field look at us, but understand that I'm a neuroradiologist. That's what it's going to say on my tombstone. That's who I am. But um, I think it's important that we um, try to get other perspectives, um, outside of perspectives on what we do. Uh, full disclosure, um, right after I got out of business school, I worked uh, for an early stage venture capital firm in the middle Atlantic region. And I still am interested in the field and I still help entrepreneurs and do some consulting. My goals for this very short 15 minute session are to make sure that I give you a very quick primer in core concepts in how PE and venture capital investment models work. I'm gonna compare and contrast them and Dr. Moore is gonna go into more detail about the private equity uh, side of the model. I, I like to be very precise about these things. Um, sometimes when I'm watching a movie or a TV show with my wife and, and they're calling someone a venture capitalist and they're clearly an investment banker or a private equity person, I like to be precise when I'm a neuroradiologist. I think we're, we're all scientists and physicians, many of us on, on this uh, program today, and we need precise language. And um, we don't wanna make mistakes and you know the conceptual issues matter, even spelling matters. Just like Iran and Iraq, you've gotta get the spelling right or you know it, it counts. So with that, I'm gonna also talk to you about some potential pitfalls in third-party investment in healthcare. And that might surprise you that somebody who's a business school professor is going to tell you that sometimes there are business things you shouldn't do, or sometimes business or corporatization, in this case, um, third-party investment makes things better all the time. It, uh, sometimes it doesn't. And we'll go through a, um, a case study or two just in the next 15 minutes to cover that. And then briefly, I wanna highlight um, how these things can happen and why I think COVID was actually a very interesting sort of stress test or what can happen with third-party investment, and where we see where some of the societal models we have for healthcare can break down when you know, the people putting the money in have different goals than we as physicians have and what our patients expect from us and what our government and our society expect from us. So as Dr. Haskell mentioned earlier, um, you know, for the non-radiologists on, on the program today, or for those of you who watch in the future, um, 
I, I put this up just to emphasize that we're not the only people getting corporatized. And I realize that construct in English kind of implies that this isn't a good thing when it's being done to you. And um, it has been happening in many sectors in US healthcare. Uh, full disclosure, I'm married to a dermatologist and she tells me stories all the time of what's happening with her friends who are in the practice of dermatology. Um, and you can just go down this list and we are only one of many types of specialties that are being purchased in um, what, what in venture capital we call either horizontal aggregations, horizontals, where you put like with like and you build um, a huge mega practice out of anest anesthesiologists or verticals where you put like and unlike together and on purpose so that you can kind of have um, the ability to come in and just take the hospital over and know that you've already got anesthesia, ED, radiology on board. And even primary care, which many people used to scratch their head and understand, try to understand why you would want to buy that with PE. Well, it makes a lot of sense, particularly when you're building a vertical. And the list is not complete. I gave a similar, um, I gave a full talk rather on corporatization in uh, the Midwest a couple months ago. And one of the radiologists came up afterwards and said, you know, Frank, my dentist was taken over by a private equity company. And the first thing they did is they started telling me that I had cavities that I didn't have. And being a radiologist, he had actually had x-ray proof that he was right. I thought this was hilarious until the same thing happened with my kid, where he went to a newly privatized, private equity purchased dentist and was told he had nine cavities that he didn't have the last time. And I said, well, let's get the x-rays. And that was the end of that. So it's happening to many of us. Now, private equity business model is an interesting one. It has been around for a fairly long time, but um, particularly came into vogue in the 80s and 90s, um, and you know, many people in my uh, Wharton class, I have an MBA, um, you know, did go into private equity because it was particularly hot in the 1990s. And these are firms that raise capital and pools from institutions and individuals in some cases, from trusts. Um, sometimes people think that this is all, you know, what's called dark money. It's coming from evil people, drug cartels, sovereign wealth funds from you know nations we don't like. But in fact, many of these come from the institu educational institutions that you attended. Many of you have money in um, accounts where one of the ways they're trying to make money for you is to um, invest in PE because as a better return. Um, the only way we can make sure we have the teacher's pensions covered and things like that is to make sure that we have money that's coming in from some of these places or else they'd have to raise our taxes. So it's not all evil money is, is the short message there. Um, they typically purchase established firms that have good cash flow, often in distressed industries. That's why it's a little surprising that they would go after the best uh, radiology practices in the country, but we'll circle back to that. They take over and they take control, unlike venture, which we'll talk about in a moment. So typically a PE firm has enough shares of the company to control it. So it's typically over 50%. In radiology purchases, the salaries may go down. Um, they usually do. The workload usually goes up in order to cover the initial purchase price and extract cash flow. People who don't like PE firms call them an extraction industry, which is normally a term we use to describe people who pull oil out of the ground. In this case, they're pulling cash out of a radiology practice. Now, I was asked once to write a, a short opinion piece that would include both the good and bad things that could happen to a practice that was taken over by a PE firm. And so in fairness, some purported practice benefits to a group that chooses to sell could include uh, perhaps restructuring, more market dominance, and or cash investment for improvements. And if the latter is done, that's usually done with debt leverage as the mechanism. And in the end, the the PE firm puts as little money as they can into the firm because they're really trying to get money out. The advantages for the sellers include getting a check up front for the buyout and then the potential value and potential is really the word that needs to be underlined of the equity. Typical investment length is relatively short. You wanna basically try to pump it up as much as you can as quickly as possible and then sell it to somebody else. Um, as Dr. 
Fleishan alluded to, um, there's a lot of activity in this area. These are PE deals. And just as you can see within a decade, there's been more than a doubling of the number of deals going on. If you look at dollar value, the numbers are even more impressive and they'd be even more impressive if we hadn't gotten hit with COVID, but we're already seeing our, um, basically a post COVID bounce for deals that were delayed or put off during uh, the height of the pandemic. Venture on the other hand uh, is a bit different. Understand that sometimes there is some overlap. Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. You think one's a lion, one's, one's a tiger, but then every once in a while, you put a lion and a tiger together and you get something that's sort of a hybrid. In this case, there we, we tend to be focused on early stage investment, small investments followed by milestones with appropriate increases. And many of the, the high tech firms in the United States were started with venture money. Um, eventually along the way, other types of money came in, but this is a very typical business model. And the investment pools are raised from pretty much the same kinds of groups that we just described, but um, sometimes these are even institutions, high net worth individuals that form the limited partners. They're ones who can really handle the illiquidity because when you give us the money, when you give a venture capitalist the money, you're really saying you can have this for 10 years or sometimes even longer than that. And there are significant penalties if you choose to pull out. And this actually came close to happening to me when um, the dot-com boom hit and we had some people in France who wanted to pull out from an investment pool um, that was from a retirement fund. And there's over a $2 million penalty for doing that. And um, But in any case, that's where the money comes from. And, that, and we'll show you in a moment how it's used. So we, again, we have a longer horizon. It takes a long time to build a company like Apple or Google or Facebook. And we'll look at some of those in just a moment. But um, typically the funds are locked up for 10 years. And e each individual sub-investment is often, you know, at least initially labeled for five to 10 years or longer. So it's sort of escrowed there in case we do follow on investing. So you give some money when somebody has an idea for a molecule, you give them some more when they actually build it. You give it some more when it seems to work in rats. You give them a little more if it doesn't kill the rats. And eventually you give them more as it gets up to people. And VCs usually deliberately take a minority ownership stake. Um, they want to get a big chunk, but they don't want to really own the company in the sense of having all of it. And usually that presence includes what's hopefully called smart money, which is not just the money, but smart people who come with it and can help entrepreneurs with starting these companies. And if you've seen the movie about Facebook, you get a little taste of that, where just as the first check is going out to the group, they're already giving them advice. They're already deliberately finding mentors for them. And these are usually cash infusions and not leverage. It's a big difference. Private equity companies often load debt on. Venture capitalists tend to hold off on that, at least until the company gets to be fairly large. The typical return on investments are quite good. They have to be well above the long-term Dow if you want to attract in you know, a university um, fund you know, to invest in your fund, you've got to let, you know, help them do better than in the stock market. Typically the targets are in double digit range at the top of the dot-com boom, people were talking about um, factors of X, X in that case is 100% and um, just sort of moving on. And recently we've seen this shift towards, at least in the US towards later stage and larger investments, but still there's a pretty sharp difference between the two. And it's a growth and development model. Again, longer holds. The investments are structured in tranches. Um, my son was just offered you know, several million dollars for a startup that he's working on, but he doesn't get the money all at once. It's again, broken up into pieces and with associated milestones. Again, it's a very hands-on type of work with entrepreneurs and board seats, but you're usually the minority. The investment goal, again, is a liquidity event, and you're more likely to go for an IPO with VC than with private equity. But there are other types of exits depending on the situation, and it's a home run industry. You get one IPO, you can have several losers, and you'll still be able to make everybody happy, and they'll re-up with you. This is just a nice graph that shows you how we calculate success, and these are the 25 best VC-backed exits of all time. And on the bottom, you can see this really runs over the last 20 years. 
And what's interesting about this is that the size of the bubbles are how much money had to be put into these companies. And this is how much money that they basically got out at their IPO or their other liquidity event. And so just a quick look, you, you know, the, the naive answer, which is the best company here, you'd say Facebook, because it looks like it has the biggest bubble. Um, or excuse me, you look at Alibaba and say, well, that's the best one on the graph because that's the most money out. Um, but then you look at Facebook and you realize like they put way more money into Facebook than they did into Alibaba. But then you come down here and they put almost nothing into Genentech and they got $50 billion. So if you look at this, this is how you calculate who actually did the best, but you still need to know how long the money was sitting in there. If it took them you know, 20 years to get to that point where they were actually able to get Genentech out the door, then it's not such a great deal because everybody cares about the time value. One of the reasons why we have problems with any form of third-party investment, and I don't want to pick just on private equity or even on VC, there's still other ways that other people invest in us or buy healthcare, and depending on what your state allows, and it's because it's this mismatch. This is the beginning of the Declaration of Geneva. This is what I said when I became a physician back in 1985. I know it's a long time ago for many of you, but just keep in mind, this is what you pledged to do, and you know when... You know, bottom of the first page, the health of my patient is going to be my first consideration. That's not how corporate culture works. Um, there are many things in clinical practice medicine that can be lucrative if businesses can monetize. But, you know, there are things that we do that are very hard, if not impossible, like charity care, service, research, teaching, mentoring, differences in culture. Also, the horizons are mismatched. I, I planned on a 30 year plus career. Most people my age did. The oldest medical school in the United States is over two and a half centuries old. The PE average target investment length is, and if we were doing this in person, I'd ask for a show of hands, but it's four years. Obviously a huge difference. And after those four years, they don't care that you mentored anybody. They don't care that you saved Mrs. Jones. Or you came in in the middle of the night to help her. It's all gone because it's a different culture and it's a different time frame. The three things that private equity people care about, ROI, ROI, and ROI. That's what they care about. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, It's, but it's a difference than I think what most of us uh, commit to with a career in medicine. Um, this is an example of one of the worst, or at least highest profile private equity uh, messes that have occurred in US healthcare. Um, I had friends who worked in this place. I worked there uh, for a uh, short period of my own career. And I got so tired of listening to people come up with the wrong explanations for what happened that I decided I'd call up Ruth Carlos and see if I could write an article about what I thought happened. And, but it was, it was very striking, very quick. The safety net hospital was shut down very quickly, so much so that there were people driving across the United States to start their residencies who found out by email that their residencies were gone. So, and it took away one of the last, uh, you know, good safety net areas in that hospitals in that part of the city. And it, you know, the, the net effect, you know, and the discussion of it tended to focus on the Philadelphia city government. It focused on some other issues. But in the end, it was you know, remarkably bad private equity investment um, and not well thought out. And the city you know, made some mistakes, but um, in the end, this hospital um, and its programs were shut down. There are some other consequences, which I don't have time to go into. People in the lay press have written about some of the egregious things that go on, including helicoptering patients around, doing procedures that aren't necessary and dermatology and some other things like that. You can read about it if you want. Um, but one of the things that I thought was interesting was to look at the investment model and then look at what happens when you have COVID where you switch from many of the, um, you stop doing some of the high profit elements in your practice. And then you're starting to take care of people with COVID and that squeezes out some of the other things that you do. Um, when we analyzed the data, it was pretty striking how private equity had, how hospitals reacted to COVID. Not all of them reacted this way, but many of them uh, were really struggling. We had an episode in uh, the East Coast where um, a private equity-backed hospital, the private equity people threatened to shut the hospital down in the middle of the pandemic. The governor blinked and actually helped them out. So if 
you know, the, the model doesn't necessarily work for all the things that we expect a hospital to do, and certainly responding appropriately to an epidemic is one of the reasons why we want hospitals and one of the reasons why we you know, sometimes give them the tax and other privileges that we do. With that, I'm out of time, but I want to say thank you very much. Um, I realize some of that was a little bit of a dark view of U.S. business, just closing there with a picture of one of my favorite people in U.S. business. That's what we um, that's who we call the good Steve, the co-founder of Apple, Steve Wozniak. So thank you very much. Dr. Alexa, that was fabulous. Um, and with that, if uh, we can hand off to you, uh, Dr. Moore. And then for those of you uh, with questions, please feel free to uh, put them into the uh, chat box while we're still on. Van, if you'll unmute, you're, it's, the stage is yours. Well, first, I'd like to thank uh, Zeev and uh, Alan for the invitation. I certainly tried to do this last year and scheduling problems prevent, prohibited it, but I think this is a great time to do it. And uh, it's a, a privilege to be with uh, Frank and Howard and uh, putting this together. So uh, thanks for that. What I want to do is just to go briefly over uh, some things, but uh, at this point in time, I have no conflicts that I need to share economically. The, uh, the views that I have are views that I've accumulated over the years. Uh, through my experiences uh, in, in dealing with uh, various practices and as other and other activities. Uh, briefly, I want to cover some of the basics to get down to the nitty gritty of those of you that don't really have uh, an understanding of private equity and a little bit how it works. Uh, I'd like to add another twist to it, and that's to explore the infinite and finite game theory as it relates to healthcare professionals and how it sort of deals with uh, the way uh, the, the business folks uh, look at uh, things and also then uh, how uh, we in medicine look and then explore the principles of the infinite game mindset and how that applies to individuals and groups and, uh, and practices over the years. So uh, I think the first thing it comes down to why and why is this uh, an important aspect of it? Well, if you look at uh, the economics of things right now, uh, the GDP for healthcare is about 18.3% uh, of uh, the GDP in the country. And so there's a, t a huge amount of money there. Uh, as Frank alluded to, there's a big growth of the private equity capital in the uh, region in this one article from Reuters uh, talks about Morgan Stanley seeing a 12% per, per annum uh, growth rate in the terms of amount of money uh, uh, under investment. Uh, as one of the highest returning classes over the past years, uh, it makes sense that folks like uh, pension plans, uh, high worth it net individuals would go to try to find and seek the highest return that they can representing it also understanding that there is some risk uh, involved. But the, the factors going forward are really the uh, democratization uh, of the, the, the increased infrastructure investment and uh, increased uh, sophistication and liquidity options going forward. As Willie Sutton would say, you know, that's we're going there because that's where the money is. And that's where uh, the potential for some of the greatest profits and returns on our investment can be. Um, if you look at private equity firms, they're really public, not publicly listed or traded. So this gives some advantages, just like a family business. They're really not subject to the uh, publicly held uh, company regulations that are out there. They, what they do is they will work with capital from others and uh, basically its own capital. And the goal, as uh, Frank alluded to, is to either take a current business and restructure it to expand operations or increase the operational efficiency and return on their investment, or they may want to start up and add a new operation uh, to, to the process in order to be able to uh, help get outside expertise to come in and uh, operation, uh, operationally bring 
uh, a new part to the business uh, online. If you look at raising capital, well, where do they get the capital from? Uh, large institutions, again, these are not evil places, insurance companies, you know, high wealth in, in, in individuals, but also endowments from universities. I would suspect that many universities, if you look at their endowment, would have a certain segment of private equity in it. So uh, again, money seeking uh, the highest rate of return possible in order to provide adequate funds and the retirement funds and uh, in insurance products that they uh, have to be able to back uh, the potential disasters. The equity firm typically will add some money, but in some cases, that may, may be about 1% or more, uh, mm -hmm. slightly more than that, with the vast majority of the equity coming uh, from outside investors. And depending upon the uh, investment uh, have, you know, that there, the company may either be undersubscribed or oversubscribed, depending upon the opportunity and the attractiveness of the opportunity. But there are a lot of individuals that are involved in this. They're investment bankers, they're private equity folks, uh, they're individuals in large bank, corporate banks that uh, are in the business of corporate funding. So it's, there are a lot of individuals that are, earn their living on the constant turnover uh, from the what's going on within uh, the private equity markets going forward. And typically the way the firms are set up uh, is that they'll have a private equity firm, they'll have a number of limited partners uh, who will have ownership in it, but won't really have any managerial say. Sometimes you'll hear about active investors and these will be a, a private equity firm or they will go on and have a seat on the board because their firm has money invested in the bank and they own, will own shares and they can be activist investors that you're, you'll hear talk about. But really where the, the fund management and the investment manager comes from is from, from the private equity firm, which is the, the, you know, typically the investing manager uh, forming a limited partnership. And so the partnership there will be um, uh, the various investors on that. And uh, when you look at how the fund function with respect to having raised the money. Uh, once the investment is closed, the company goes out and they look for the various opportunities. Uh, you'll have specialty private equity firms that will look at, okay, only real estate, or they may only look at certain areas of high tech. Uh, there are some cap uh, companies that look at, you know, very large buildings, uh, companies in very large uh, areas, KKR, uh, Blackstone, those are two large, very large private equity companies that have a lot of resources and they'll look for big investors. Uh, you'll have smaller private equity companies that will be a little bit more boutique and what they'll do and some may focus on medicine, some may, you know, they'll focus on all various aspects of, of the market. And what will happen is e, the PE firm, when they buy and they go in and invest it, they'll may pay off the shareholders. A lot of the times they'll want the uh, previous owners to stay because they were the ones that put the business, they were the ones that know the business better. But as the time goes on through the period of ownership for the next three to seven years, uh, for instance, uh, that ownership will change in the ownership model. Uh, but uh, overall, the, the managing partner typically has the veto power for all of the transactions that would be able to go forward. And in doing so, one of the other aspects of um, this process is in uh, the uh, private leveraging and le leveraging is often used depending upon the leverage amount, uh, the uh, return of investment, but uh, there are various aspects. Some com uh, companies can be a very highly leveraged and I'll talk about one example uh, going forward. Others may be much smaller. I know there's a patient that recently paper that recently came out of Duke that talked about the optimal study would be a debt value at about 50%. So 50% uh, of the uh, equity coming in would be uh, from uh, borrowing and the other would be equity put up mostly by the limited partners and to a certain extent by the managing partner. Uh, what the managing partner then does is with the expertise that they've gained over the years and the experts that they bring in, we'll look and develop a strategy on how they're going to go and develop the comp company going forward. Uh, they'll have a game plan once they put the company together and that's what they're going to do. And they 
once they have this, they typically then take uh, a percent of the profits and they'll split the profits with the limiting partners. But because the managing partner uh, typically doesn't put a lot of assets within, then the majority of the profits uh, go to the limited partners and the majority ma the manager then typically makes their fees from the management fees that they charge for managing the corporation and also uh, from the monitoring fees. Uh, the whole idea is that as they go forward, as they complete the deal, they've already got a playbook, a strategic game plan for value creation. And once they have that, it's just almost like a, a sports team. They're, they're going to have uh, goals that they're going to set and they're going to do, and they're not going to vary from that. It's, uh, looking to do that and close it out in the time frame forward. If they can create a great deal of value in a very short period of time, then uh, they'll look to move that and then sell and move on and take those assets and, and put it towards another investment opportunity. If it takes a little longer, uh, then they'll have other things that they'll do to try to bring in to, to enhance the value of the uh, company in order for the next buyer, whether it's an IPO, uh, whether they sell it to a, a, another company or a larger company that will take that and incorporate it into the process, or whether they sell it to another uh, 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 investment fund to, to go forward. So again, optimize the value over the short term to get the short term gains, as, as uh, Frank talked about, by cutting costs, paying down the debt that's used to finance the deal. That's always a, a benefit in order to be able to get the debt ratio to EBITDA uh, down to a, an optimal level. Most uh, folks say that that should be two to one. And if it gets above that, then that's, that becomes a concern about being able to turn it over quickly. Uh, and again, the uh, end game has got to be uh, acquisition by a public or pri another private company or an IPO, or again, just repeat it by going forward with the uh, another. Uh, but it, the emphasis on here is on the short term gains. Uh, so if you look at uh, the, what's happening within a private equity company, there are two things that are in play here. One is an infinite game. The private equity company wants to continue to do this. They want to uh, turn it over, take their profits, roll it in, and do another investment, another deal, and another deal, and another deal. So the more investing successful investments they do and the more equity they can build up and the more deals that they can do and the larger they can grow, not just KKR, Blackstone, and some of the other big companies paying capital. Uh, if you look at the game theory, though, for the infinite game, the infinite game is uh, where they'll be able to go forward. So the selling and the moving the companies are really a, a finite game. And the infinite game is uh, really what they're trying to do to maintain the business. And what's a good example of this? Well. Uh, if you look at the NBA or the professional sports, these are both uh, great examples of, you know, these are, these are leagues that are in business to be perpetuate themselves for a long period of time to stay in business as long as they can, but uh, and then grow and develop uh, the fact that they're doing finite games and but each each game that they have is a finite game or a finite season. Uh, they opens and closes, and then they they move forward. So when you look at uh, this, and it's a very complex subject, I would recommend looking at um, the uh, this from the uh, recommended reading from Simon Sinek and James Cars. Uh, the great stuff. Uh, Simon Sinek has got a lot of uh, YouTube videos on it, so those are good resources as well. Uh, when you compare the two. The finite game and the uh, infinite game, there, there are a lot of fixed rules, there are known players, there are set boundaries, uh, uh, the competitions between players, uh, uh, whereas in, in the infinite game, there are a lot of variables, uh, the players are known but unknown, you have to be prepared to adopt a change, uh, you're really competing more against yourself. And when you look at it in terms of battles and wars, it's more really about in the infinite game, it's more about winning the war long term than it is about winning any particular battle. Uh, so examples of infinite games, if you look at this, uh, 
as an individual, your profession or professional pursuits, as Frank talked about uh, and touched on on a macro level, um, the uh, societal uh, health and healthcare are among the list of uh, what are really the infinite uh, ideas of an infinite game. And Frank touched on this in terms of uh, the, the point of view with respect to uh, what's going on in uh, medical, you know, we've been, the medical profession has been around for millennia uh, and the focus on what we're doing. The interesting part is, is that over the time that it's developed, it developed independently in a lot of different areas, but really basically the principles are the same dating back to the Hippocratic Oath, uh, you know, more than 2,500 years ago. Uh, so the games of just causes or ideals, and we touched on that just a little bit, but a just cause describes what, you know, what, what are the causes, what do we believe in, what, what are the things that we see that we want to do, and what do we want to make our commitment to our profession on. Uh, the Hippocratic Oath and what Frank talked about earlier is some of that, but also if you go over and look at other things to help better decide that, looking at the various mission and uh, vision statements of the organizations that you belong to or you work for, that helps better define some of those processes. Uh, looking very quickly at a uh, private equity company that, uh, or a company that actually bought by private equity, uh, Envision Healthcare, which is a uh, 2,500 clinicians. They've got a lot of things that they talk about of improving society, leading away from better healthcare system, creating billing, uh, billing teams. Uh, won't go into this, but they have a long history. It started out as a small practice in Dallas, Texas, which grew uh, and became known as MCARE. Uh, they were purchased by a private equity company, which is then sold to another private equity company or sold to another private equity company. Uh, named Envision, uh, and finally they came out with an IPO uh, that uh, then merged with Amsurge, which was another private equity company that uh, moved forward. You may know some radiologists that work for uh, Sheridan Healthcare in Florida, uh, but again, those are uh, uh, a, a growth that, that occurred. And Amsurge uh, was uh, tried to buy Team Health back in 2017. Uh, that precipitated uh, the Blackstone buying Team Health and a separate PE acquisition. But KKR bought uh, Envision uh, for $9.9 billion. And interestingly, uh, $7.7 .7 billion of that was a debt. So you can see that there's got a very high uh, debt to value ratio uh, in that whole process. So what's happened now in the two and a half years subsequent to that? Well, uh, back is once uh, COVID started, uh, there was a uh, notice in the uh, Nashville newspaper that, hey, gee, uh, you know, there's some trouble in River City. The debt that they had uh, there, the bonds, uh, which were trading at par on one dollar on a dollar, went down to 30 cents on a dollar. Uh, and, you know, what are they going to do? How are they going to refinance, the, you know, the debt going forward? Uh, the debt ratings in that point in time, you know, were, uh, you know the debt corporate structure is unsustainable. Uh, Envision could go into default within the next year or two. Uh, Moody's was indicating, and it's pretty clear that they're going to run out of money. Uh, so uh, if you look at another source uh, here, Envision, a very weak liquidity following over the next 10 to 12, 12 to 18 months. The cash reserve will likely run dry by the end of next year. Well, this was in 2022, and now it's 2023. So uh, there's going to be concerns about what happens at the at the end of this year when they go forward. So um, if you look at that and you say, okay, 2022 to talk of bankruptcy and what's really going to happen and how are they going to do things going forward? Will they go chapter 11 uh, or will they just completely run out of money? And uh, you know what what happens if that happens and they're not able to restructure the company go, to going forward? Well, if you look at chapter 11 versus chapter seven, uh, chapter 11, they'd be, they're able to do things and renegotiate, restructure the debt and try to protect uh, the company from the creditors. But if they can't do it, then they go into chapter seven. And in uh, doing that, uh, they, who, who gets uh, to get the trough to see what's left when the company, in terms of the assets, well, the secured creditors, the unsecured creditors, and in the end, 
the shareholders, those that own the private equity uh, part, uh, were the ones that uh, uh, may or may not get anything at the end. So what happens when you run out of money? If you go back and you look at Aeros Radiology, which is owned by Great Point Partners at that point in time, if those of you that are out there that can remember this, uh, Aeros was actually a good little company. Uh, they, one of the things I admired about them was they had a great uh, tele pediatric teleradiology service. Uh, they provided a lot of after-hour pediatric radiology coverage for, for practices. But in March 6th of 2020, uh, all of a sudden, all their clients got uh, this email that uh, our funding agency is no longer going to afford, afford us. And so, unfortunately, we're ceasing business uh, on a, before March 5th, uh, 13th, which is a Friday at 5 o'clock, uh, which left a whole lot of folks scrambling. Uh, so, again, you, know, you can go back and uh, you take your own personal inventory in terms of what's finite and what's infinite and what are the values what are your what are your beliefs? What are your values? What do you see yourself, you know, as your profession, you know, going forward? You know, all right, this is a great book. Uh, many of us have read it, probably built to last uh, about great corporations that, uh, you know, have uh, been able to stand the test of time that are built to last. Jim Collins out of Colorado did it. But if you look at uh, changing that, you know, successful private equity game plans, you know, are they really built to last or really are they looking to build to sell? And hopefully the next iteration of the company will be that that goes to the IPO that gets built, built to, uh, to move forward. So uh, just one real quick, and I'll try to make this brief because I know we're running out of time. Uh, if you look at the stability of the uh, infinite game player versus an infinite game player, you have a stable system. It's a great video uh, YouTube on this by Simon Sinek. You got a stable system. If you have a finite game versus a finite game, you know, again, in sports, you know, you got a stable system. So, what happens when you have the infinite game player uh, get involved uh, in a finite with a finite game player? Well, you, you come up with a uh, an unstable system. And one of the great uh, changes that I see that Simon Sinek talks about with respect to that is that looking looking you know forward in war. Uh, if you look at this, this is a picture of uh, the Viet Cong, you know, fighting uh, the allies, uh, the U.S. led allies and others, you know, in Vietnam. Undermanned, under, you know, didn't have tanks, didn't have sophisticated jets and all this sort of thing. But over time, you know, their persistence and believing in their cause, you know, they ended up winning the war. Similar for the Mujahideen. Uh, in Afghanistan, when the Russians invaded and tried to take over Afghanistan, uh, the, the transistor was there, and they did have some fuel radios, but you know, again, no sophisticated tanks and none of that stuff. Uh, and in the end, the Russians left, and actually, that was probably what led to the downfall of the Soviet Union back in the eighties. Uh, our more recent experience, the Taliban, you know, in uh, Afghanistan and the, the war that we were we've gone on. They were persistent, they've gone forward, uh, but in the end, uh, who overcame and, and where where are they within the Afghanistan role? Again, they're in control of the nation and moving that forward. So the, the, they are being the infinite game player uh, was a winner in that concept. And it's not unlike the, uh, the colonies back in the 1776, uh, when uh, the British well-heeled, well-financed, uh, uh, but they really didn't have their heart and soul into it, and they weren't committed uh, to go forward. And, and that's why we now celebrate uh, our independence uh, on July 4th every year. So in closing, uh, really quickly, and sorry we're taking so long to do this, it, it, you know, it, we talked about in my president's speech at the college back in 2009 that we're, change is a constant, and we're all going to have to adapt, whether you're independent practice or whatnot, to change uh, and being able to stay and be an infinite player. Uh, the most important part, I think, in us with respect to especially medical professionals to keep the welfare and the health of our patients first and foremost and what we want to do. And then in doing that, you know, you make the commitments that you want to have with respect to the being a player with the infinite game uh, and the development of your infinite game mindset. Uh, and if you go and you can talk about this and look at the, the book uh, these are some of the principles that you need to look at 
you know, going forward and, you know, could talk 50 or 20 minutes uh, on just these five different points. But uh, with closing that again, thanks for your time. Uh, I appreciate having the opportunity to share this with Frank and Howard. Sorry, run over just a little bit, but uh, to, back to you. Um, uh, thank you. And you can stop sharing your screen there. Uh, Van, that was uh, spectacular as well as from Frank. What a fabulous education introduction, a lot of important concepts to people. You know, it's, it's said that the average number of moves that uh, physicians make is uh, a minimum of three over their career. People imagine that they're going to land in a job and stay there forever. And the majority of us in radiology and specialties that you mentioned and more are going to be looking at private practice shops. So this is really fundamentally important. But how about if we, as a start conversations, take this from sort of the personal perspective of looking up or looking into the future? For example, um, you know, as a job applicant, whether you're starting out or you're considering making a move, uh, to, you know, what kind of questions can you ask? Or how do you form these questions as to are you going to be selling your practice? And if you do, what can I expect? Or um, what is the stability of practice? What kind of tips can uh, people be thinking about? Frank, you want to start? Sure, I'll, I'll start with the stability question because I also think that's probably the better way to have this kind of a com conversation and then get to the tough one a little bit later. But certainly you wanna know what the turnover has been. You wanna know what the growth pattern has been. It's reasonable to ask who do you compete against? Um, what are your plans for expanding the practice and hiring over the next five to 10 years? Um, you know, talk about the relationships with the key people in the area, and that starts with the hospital administration, but it often includes the local government and in many states, the state government. And so I would get a, try to get a sense of the stability first. And, and that's important because that's going to matter whether the practice is sold or not uh, when you're coming into the practice first. So I'd start with those things. Van, do you want to take a shot at this? And we can go back and forth. Yeah, I, I think you know those are great points. I think the thing that I would do, and, and knowing what I know now, is I would, you know, talk to the leaders and I would say, well, what's your strategic plan? You know, what are you looking to accomplish? You know, where where are you going? How do you see the future? You know, what's your relationship with the uh, your hospitals and other uh, healthcare entities in your in your neighborhood? All politics and especially in medicine is, is local, and you know. How do you see your relationship in your, you know, the next five and the next 10 years? You know, where do you want to go with that? I would also ask, you know, how how are you planning to, you know, to change, to adapt to the, the current environment? And what what is your leadership development? You know, you may be a great leader, but, you know, who's going to be in the, the chair sitting next to you the next time? You know, and how are you developing those leaders uh, for you? And what are you looking to do that? Because... One of the things, and you know, Frank knows this from me, is that you know, I'm very passionate about you know developing a foreign team and you know leadership development in our profession, not just uh, radiology but in medicine. It's going to be critical to what we do, and uh, you know I think that we need to be more aggressive as a profession in developing those leaders to be able to do that. So don't be embarrassed or don't be afraid to ask the tough questions. You know you know, about the future so that you can see yourself in five, in 10 years and how you can fit, you would fit in the practice. You know, I, I was very lucky. I came to Charlotte in 1983. I, you know, it, it was uh, something that uh, I was able to do and we were able to build going forward, but it didn't happen by accident, that's for sure. And I would just build on that and say that I, I think that the majority of people I know who are in what Dr. Fleischman was calling you know, independent private practice, you know, sort of you know, a group that still has arm's length contracts, um, they would welcome somebody who's thinking about joining the practice who expresses an interest in leadership. Uh, many of them feel like they're doing too much of the leadership themselves. They don't have a big enough support circle. And many of them are also, you know, trying to think about succession. So the notion that they may be, you know, as Van just said, you know, building a farm team, getting people, you know, ready for this, that's all critical for them. 
I also don't think there's anything wrong with asking if the group has thought about selling. I, I think anybody who tells you that they haven't at least thought about it is probably not telling you the truth. Also, anybody who you talk to who's at a decent practice um, has at least been through a period, it may have quieted down a bit, where they were getting cold called nonstop by people with money. And I was at RSNA and talked to somebody who claimed that they had $100 million in ready cash to buy US practices and $400 million in guaranteed funds from um, investing group in Canada that could back up the first hundred. So everybody's been approached. And it's an interesting question to ask, well, you know, why did you know why did you not do it? Just understand that if someone is in the midst of a transaction, they may be under an NDA and they may be in an impossible situation where if they say, well, I really can't tell you that, they may be, don't be insulted. They may really not be able to tell you that, but like some things in poker, they may be telling you a lot by not telling you. So that's part of it. So maybe take maybe take it to the next uh, natural step, which is you're looking at a practice or you're in a practice, <clears throat> practice due to make itself a, uh, you know, sort of the porcupine practice, you know, sweet on the inside, but uh, spiky in terms of acquisition or otherwise, or, or prevent from being purchased. As you're thinking about asking these questions or you're in it. Van, you want to start? So rephrase the question because I'm not sure I caught that uh, should the, the last little um, piece. Uh, what can what can practices do to perhaps prevent themselves from uh, um, being acquired or being taken over by an outside entity? I I don't I think the the best thing is to have you know strong leadership and have a strong vision of the future. Uh, that that's you know what you want to do is. Uh, you see that your independence, you know, there are many ways that an independent practice can go you know, within strategic radiology. One of the things that we prided ourselves in was we were independent, but interdependent practices, you know, each practice maintained their independence. And so that in and of itself, uh, I think the comfort that you've got a good, strong strategic plan, you've got a great vision of the future. You, you know, where you're going, uh, you know, the, the old African saying uh, that says, you know, if you want to go fast, you know, go by yourself. But if you want to go far, go together, you know, working together as a team uh, and you know, within your practice or with uh, some others uh, help uh, inure yourself to any of the uh, ideas that you might want to be taken over. Because that would come from actually within, not from ex external forces. And so when you're talking about leadership, are you also emphasizing the importance of getting involved in hospital leadership, you know, in, into the sweet suites or what kind of um, leadership characteristics and positioning should you be looking at as you're either aiming for them or, or vetting the practice to know that they're well, they've got a strong foundation? Well, I'll, I'll jump in and start on this one. I think that one of the things you want to look for is a practice that's not commoditized. Um, and so one of the things you're, you'd be looking for is a practice, as you just described, that is working in tandem with their partners. Um, if you're working closely with the C-suite, you're not going to be surprised. You're not going to suddenly find out that they're moving the emergency room to another building or that kind of thing, or they're shutting down the Women's Imaging Center or something like that. You're working as a, as a true partner rather than as sort of a contracted entity. Um, you're also building. Um, and uh, to Dr. Moore's point, you're also providing strategic vision. Um, you would want the C-suite, you would want your other partners to be hearing about the future of radiology from you for several reasons. One, you should be aligned. Number two, you should have a vision, as he said. And number three, if you're not telling them where radiology is going, they're gonna have somebody else tell them. And it's not necessarily the vision that's true and it's probably not the vision you want. So it is about owning the future. And I, I completely agree that strategy is one of the critical things that I listen for. Um, when I'm trying to assess the health of a practice, I, I do consulting work for private practices. And that's one of the things that I listen for. And then that connectedness, that sense of building, 
that sense of staying ahead, that sense of understanding that for better or worse, we live in a very dynamic country where things change very quickly. And we seem to do experiments that people in many other parts of the world kind of scratch their head and say, I can't believe they're doing that there. So that kind of thing happens. And I, I would agree with Frank, uh, just to say, you know, it, it, involved with the medical staff on multiple levels. You know, you've got to form, you have to have your practice function as a team. Not everybody can, you know, the, the head of the practice can't go around and do everything for everybody. You delegate, you develop, uh, that's the way you develop leaders. You know, future leaders, you go forward, they get they get involved such that you, know, you develop a lot of trust with the individuals that are in the leadership of the administrative side, plus the medical staff. Medical staff can be your strongest allies in developing this trust and the bonds with those that you're practicing shoulder to shoulder with within the hospital. So the type of involvement you talk about, Zeev, is critical uh, in doing it and being able to uh, help the, make you know, push the hospital to move things forward and not not be you know felt feel like that they're dragging you along. So so let me ask you guys to put your wizard hats on and do some. Uh, Mega trends forecast, which is what's your prediction on how inevitable it's going to be that the ownership of radiologists and these kinds of practices, like you, um, like you mentioned, Frank, and other specialties, are going to be corporately owned? How how far do you think that's going to shift over the next ten years? Okay, well, since it's being recorded forever, um, we could get <laughs> together for a beer in ten years and see if we get it right. Um, I'll make two comments. First of all, never believe a graph that you know shows this. You know, we always have these graphs that show the line going up, and we project it out linearly, and we are always wrong. So, I had a junior high school, you know, teacher who said the world's going to run out of oil in 1985, kind of story. You're not looking at the other issues that happen as you know these things occur. If you look at a reasonable comparable for the US, it's not perfect, but in Australia, it got to be well over half of private practice in radiology was corporatized. Um, it's an easier country to corporatize because if you've ever been to Australia, and I've been there a couple of times, including getting married there, I, I like Australia, I'm not saying this to make fun of them, but it's a relatively easy country to take over because almost everybody lives in a handful of coastal cities and the rest of it looks kind of like Arizona. It's kind of dry and red and dusty and very few people live there. So it's not a perfect comparable for a country like the States where we have lots of small towns like we do in Pennsylvania, which has the most small towns and uh, population tends to be more distributed. But the bottom line is that I think you could easily see it get to be up into the range of two thirds or so of private practice. But I bet it will be like everything else in, these, in the states, very chunky. It's not going to be evenly distributed. There'll be states where there's more. There'll be states where there's a lot less. And then for a variety of reasons, we'll see what again happened in Australia, which is then they're kind of reached a high watermark and then it's gone back a bit. So even though it never got to 100%, it didn't even stay at the high water mark. But younger people who were more nimble, better at service, um, pushed back on some of these large corporations. And now it's sort of in, I wouldn't say it's in an equilibrium, but it's it, it just is a reminder that the future isn't inevitable, even if it did swing that far. But I would say it's an easy bet, bar, an easier bar bet would be that it will be well over half of U.S., radiologists will be working for someone else rather than themselves. What do you think, Van? Well, tough question. Um, I, I think that there's definitely going to be a consolidation. Uh, and you know, I think that's inevitable. The, you know, there's the, the gravitational forces and you know, the, the uh, tendency to consolidate is going to be there. I think the question is going to be what are the models and what works and how effective we are going to be as a profession in developing leaders that can really form and uh, put together uh, a, a Mollage or collage of uh, the ways that we practice medicine, so we effectively work together as teams across specialties, but also effectively work together. Uh, 
I don't, I'm not sure that, uh, and I don't think that the private equity model is going to work. And I, I, you know, the question is going to be how, what is, who's going to be buying some of these large practices as, you, as they go forward, you know, and then are those practices going to, if those corporations are really going to be able to, to manage the sort of a broad diversification of the practices. If you look at universities uh, you know, across the country, you know, they do, uh, university practices, they do a pretty good job of pulling it together. But, you know, how do you manage a, a large number of practices a, across state lines going forward? Because there's just such a lot of difference in the variabilities and the demographics, uh, you know, in each setting. Uh, so I, I do think there's going to be some consolidation. Uh, but I would be surprised if, uh, you know, corporations, especially physician corporations, uh, were the drivers uh, in the end. I would hope that the uh, physicians can develop enough good leadership to be able to, you know, have a significant say in that. And I think, you know, if you're a person that's an infinite game player and have that sort of vision, uh, there are there's the potential for being able to do it. But it's the key thing is going to take strong leaders as uh, as a you know part of it. So I, I'd like to see where it's going to be in 20 years. I think that's to be fascinating. Frank, any closing comments? No, I just want to thank you again. This has been a real pleasure and uh, it's been great to see you again. It's been great to work with Dr. Moore and Dr. Fleischon and just thank you and um, your great university for having us. Yeah, great idea the way you put this together. So I'm glad we were able to get it done. The future ain't what it used to be, right? <laughs> so, um, we will uh, post some uh, resources and some reading that you've mentioned as well when this goes up. I, I'm so grateful to all of you for being here. Um, thank you both. And thank you to Professor Fleischman as well. And of course, uh, Jordan and Terry for setting this up. Um, goodbye, everyone. Thank goodbye. you.